On January 2nd, 2020, a 911 call came in to the Bismarck Police Department in North Dakota. The caller was reporting a house fire. A family lived in the home, and sadly, one of them hadn't made it out alive. Initially, it was believed to be a tragic accident, but soon enough, things were not adding up. Join us as we unravel the truth about what happened that cold winter day as the real story began to emerge. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 16 of the Dark Levity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberleya, and I'm here with my co-host, my best friend, my fiance, Jonathan. Hi. Dark Levity. It's the dark downward slope into the degradation of the human mind and the consequences that such darkness brings to light. And by the way, we knew the word consequences was misspelled in our graphic. We didn't have time to change it, but thank you for letting us know. We do appreciate it. And I can't believe we're so close to episode 20. So thank you so much for all your support. I think 20 is like, you know, it's like one of those numbers. That's why I'm calling out 20, but thank you for all of your support for this channel and everything that we're doing in life right now. This was just a thought in the beginning and now it became a reality. I can't wait to do 20 more. I know, 200 more. So we try to post every Monday, but don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss out just in case we decide to post on a different day like this one. Yes, we did have to take a little break. We had a lot going on and I'm sure you can relate to the holidays and whatnot. But for today's case, we're taking you to Bismarck, North Dakota, where a family of four lived on the outskirts of town on 35 acres of land at 4900 43rd Avenue Northeast in Bismarck. It was the home of married couple Chad and Nikki Ensel and their two children, 18-year-old Marcus and 12-year-old Christopher. But just like we always do, we want to take you back in time to tell you about Chad and Nikki before they met and how they came together. Chad Allen Ensel was born on March 31st, 1977 in Halliday, North Dakota, to his parents, Ernest and Deborah. He grew up in a small town surrounded by nature, which contributed to him fostering a deep appreciation for the outdoors and community service. He had one younger sister, Lori, who was four years younger than him, and he really took her under his wing and took care of her. They were inseparable. Chad's mom described her children as being so close, they almost knew what the other was thinking. Chad was gentle, caring, and always happy. As they got older, Chad would often take care of Lori, babysitting when his parents weren't home, and even taught her how to ride a bike. They remained close as they got older. And one thing about Chad that everyone always noticed was his crazy grin and his dimples. People were constantly commenting on his dimples. So every time you'd see him, he'd be smiling, he'd have a joke to tell, but he was equally very kind and would be the type to make sure he called his mom on her birthday every year, never missing the opportunity to show her how much he cared. Just an overall pleasant and patient guy. And after graduating from high school, he pursued drafting at Wapetan College. And even though academics never ignited his passion, Chad found joy in outdoor work. He loved socializing, coaching the Little League, and enjoying bowling with friends. While he also dabbled in golf and darts, but his true passion was stock car racing, where he excelled and he loved being at the track and racing cars. And eventually, Chad met a woman named Susie and they got married around 1995. They were married for 17 years and they were very close with Chad's family, especially with Lori. They'd get together for weekly dinners and the couple got along really well. However, over the years, they did begin to drift apart. Chad, as I said, loved being social. He was a very social guy. And eventually Susie said that his social calendar took a toll on their marriage. Susie felt like he prioritized his friends and his other interests over their relationship. Susie just felt like Chad was never home. He was always involved in projects that didn't involve her. And they ended up amicably divorcing around 2012 after almost two decades of being together. Chad also lost his father the following year in 2013. Sadly, he did die from cancer, so that was a lot for Chad to take in. But he did his best to pull himself together. And with Chad being so social, he really wanted someone by his side. He was the relationship type of guy, so he was already hoping to find someone that suited him better than Susie did. He was in a different part of his life, now in his 30s. He had not had children with Susie, so he was single, without kids, and looking for a match. 
He was a really energetic, happy guy who always wore a smile. But following the divorce, he kind of fell apart a bit emotionally. But once he was back on his feet, he started putting himself out there on dating sites since he really wanted to settle down and be in a relationship. Finally, later in 2013, when he was out racing his stock car in Jamestown, North Dakota, he connected with a woman who eventually became his wife, Nikki Sue Melissa Hines. She was five years younger than Chad. She was a single mother of two boys, Marcus and Christopher, who were about eight and 14 years old. Chad and Nikki just hit it off. They were both really into racing. She raced too, and they would see each other at these race events all over the state. It wasn't long before he was bragging about his new girl he met to all his friends. He spoke very highly of Nikki, who was working in a nursing home and living in South Dakota at that time. The more they talked, the more Chad really wanted to see more of Nikki. So he began making trips out to South Dakota, and she would also visit him in North Dakota. They went on for a little while, a long-distance relationship. They did this in a more casual way, but it's true that sometimes relationships move a lot faster, especially when you're older. You know what you're looking for, and you can size people up quickly with the wisdom gained from previous relationships. And because of that, Chad and Nikki ended up moving in together just a few months after meeting. It was easier than having to travel back and forth all the time. At first, they were living at Chad's house, but eventually he sold it, and Nikki, Chad, and the two boys decided to rent a house on the outskirts of Bismarck at 4900 43rd Avenue. It was a nice big home on a lot of land, a two-story, four-bedroom home with a long dirt driveway that leads up to a three-car garage. Bismarck is a nice place to raise kids. It's a family-friendly town where everyone knows one another. It has a real small-town feel to it. It's safe, and there are a lot of community activities there. But it has been called one of the coldest places on Earth. The winters are brutally cold unbearable so people stay inside usually and it can become very isolating especially if you don't have a significant other or family the coldest month is january when the average overnight temperature is minus 0.6 degrees that's a hard no for me the winters also start in late november and they go all the way into late march and for me i carry around my space heater all over and we're in sunny california so there's no way that i would survive there the average temperature during the day in bismarck is only 28 degrees nope not for me but some people absolutely love it but when it does get really cold most people aren't doing much outside except maybe shoveling snow so instead they turn to fun indoor activities like going to restaurants bars playing pool darts going bowling things like that unless you decide to leave altogether for the winter which is what a lot of residents decide to do to escape the cold altogether Sadly, because of the weather, especially in the winter, this area is known for seasonal depression, and it can affect people because of the isolation, the very short days. So depression is a lot more common. That and excessive drinking, which unfortunately can lead to self-inflicted deaths. And during the winter there, a lot more of these deaths are reported. Chad was used to the snow. He'd been in it his whole life, so it didn't really bother him that much. And now he also had Nikki, Marcus, and Christopher by his side. He also had a lot of friends in this area and coworkers that he'd known for years at his workplace at Interstate Power. They repair all kinds of engines and things like that. Nikki also had a job. She started a catering company out of their home. So she was doing that while he was at work. Chad introduced Nikki and her kids to his mom sometime in the fall of 2015, and Deb thought Nikki was really quiet compared to Chad, but she seemed nice and got along really well with Chad. But as many mothers would, she worried that Chad may be jumping into a serious relationship a little too fast after his divorce and also the death of his father. She thought it might be some kind of rebound. It had only been maybe a year and a half. But Chad was 38 years old at the time. He was a grown man, able to make his own decisions. And not long after this, Chad told his sister Lori he planned to propose to Nikki. Lori hadn't even had the chance to meet her, but she trusted her brother's judgment and she heard great things about Nikki. However, being the caring sister, she mentioned to Chad that marrying someone with kids that are not yours can create a different dynamic, and she wanted to make sure he was ready for that. At that time, Lori had two boys that weren't that far off in age from Nikki's youngest child. Lori's boys were about eight and one, so she had experience with kids, but Chad did not. He was a great uncle, always attentive to Lori's kids. Still, she just wanted to make sure Chad knew what he was taking on. And he said he did, and that he got along great with the boys, especially the younger one, Christopher. 
They loved fishing, racing cars together, and watching and playing sports. Nikki's older son was diagnosed with autism, so he didn't do as much as Christopher and Chad, but Chad still got along great with him. So much so that the boys ended up calling Chad dad. And then he went forward and proposed to Nikki. They got married on May 21st, 2016, but unlike his first wedding to Susie, Chad didn't invite his family to this marriage. Instead, the couple eloped in Vegas. That's actually pretty common when it's your second marriage. And we know this is Chad's second. I'm not too sure about Nikki, but at the very least, she had had a couple previous relationships that were serious with her boy's fathers. So sometimes couples just don't want to spend the money. They don't want a big lavish event again. They're just ready to settle down. Once they were married, Chad and Nikki spent time with Chad's family. Lori finally got to meet Nikki and her boys, and they got along great with Lori's boys. Everyone would get together for birthdays, holidays, and even just dinners on a regular basis. Chad once again had a busy social life. He worked all day, then a couple nights a week he would play darts with friends, and a couple other nights he would bowl as part of a league in town. He was really good at bowling with perfect or near perfect scores every time. He also still went to the track and was known for having a bright green race car. They refer to it as the Grinch. Nikki spent the time she wasn't with Chad on her own hobbies. She loved baking so much that she started that catering business out of her home. So she would spend her time on that when Chad was out with his friends. By November 2019, Chad sold his home and the family had moved into the house we showed you earlier on the outskirts of Bismarck. The new house was only a five-minute drive from Chad's job at Interstate. Nikki also got a job in addition to catering. She was now working at a place called Community Options. It was only seven minutes away from their house, and they specialized in placing people in jobs, kind of like a staffing agency, but they focused on helping people with troubled histories get employed. Someone who may have been fired at a past place of employment, for example. Oh, and I've <laughs> been there. I got fired from a tanning salon once for telling people that there was a risk of skin cancer. And I also got fired from Abercrombie because I was taking antibiotics at the time and they wouldn't let me leave to get a glass of water. So I just walked out. Have you ever been fired from somewhere? I have. I used to work as a bag boy at the neighborhood grocery store, and I soon became the phantom of the freezer. I would restock oh the gosh. freezer, and I would lurk in the icy depths of unsuspecting customers and scare them. Oh my gosh, I am sorry that I even asked. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, needless to say, I don't think the customers liked my uh, chilling sense of humor. You've been scaring me since the day that we met, and <laughs> he scared me so bad the other day I told him I was about to give birth. <laughs> So what about any of you? Have you ever been fired from a job? Because I like reading the comments. So let me know if you're willing to tell me your secrets. So let's jump back into the winter of 2019. The holidays are here. No one knows what's coming in 2020, that the world would be changed in an instant with COVID. But before that, things were normal in the Ansel's life. It was the calm before the storm, before tragedy would strike. Chad's sister Lori had an early Christmas dinner for the family. It was on Saturday the 21st of December. Nikki's boys were actually out of town, back in South Dakota, visiting their grandmother, which is something they did regularly, especially during the holidays. So it was just Chad, Nikki, Lori, her husband Richard, and their two boys with Chad's mom over for dinner that night. No one knew what was to come. They had a lovely evening together, eating, drinking, and spending quality time with one another. When no one could have predicted was that one of them would be dead just after ringing in the new year. Everything was as it should have been until Thursday, just before 5.20 p.m. on January 2nd, 2020. That's when a 911 call was made by a woman. She was calling from home in Bismarck reporting that she believed there may be a fire inside her house. The caller was Nikki Ansel. That evening, she had left work around 5 p.m., and when she got to the house, she opened the garage door with her remote, proceeded into the house through the inside door that goes from the garage into their mudroom, and she noticed the smell of smoke. And when she opened the door, she could see black smoke had filled their house. The intensity of the smoke was preventing her from getting through the door. So in a panic, she turned around, raced back to the driveway, and called 911. At first, Nikki is calm. She seems as though she's trying to figure out what's really going on, if there's a fire and why there's smoke inside their house. But as this call progressed, it became more and more chaotic. And there were times that she was very unclear. It's as though she started to realize that there could be something really wrong. And that is when she begins crying. Let's play the beginning of that call now. 
say compared to other 911 calls that we've heard and played for all of you this operator was calm he sounded like he cared he was patient he tried to calm nikki down and make sure she was safe unlike some other rude and impatient ones we've witnessed before and before becoming hysterical nikki explained to the operator that her husband had recently been sick and hadn't gone to work for a few days and Nikki had been swamped that day. Still, his co-workers had become concerned when he failed to show up for a shift or return their calls. So they called Nikki, asking if she knew where he was. She said she did not, and she just figured he was sleeping because he had a cold. Chad's silence was unlike him. He was known for being responsible and very communicative. He never missed a day of work without calling in and letting them know. So his co-workers tried to reach him throughout the day, calling both Nikki and Chad several times. Nikki couldn't get away from work to check on him until now, when she got home to find smoke inside the house. Well, earlier that same day, around 1 p.m., his co-workers took the five-minute drive over to his house to see if he was there and if everything was okay. They were like family, they cared for one another, and if Chad needed anything, they wanted to be there for him. They knocked and got no answer. They couldn't reach Nikki either, but took note that Chad's truck was in the driveway so one of his co-workers, Adam Van Dorn, called the non-emergency police line to request a welfare check on the home. So hours before Nikki's 911 call, an officer went over to Chad and Nikki's home. He knocked and walked around the premises, but got no response. Nothing looked out of the ordinary either, so he just left a card with his name and number at the front door. There wasn't much else he could do. What's noteworthy is that the police officer didn't see or smell any smoke when he approached the home, and he did look through the windows as well. He did, however, also note Chad's truck, and when he looked inside, he saw a frozen water bottle in the cup holder, which meant that it had been sitting there for quite some time. He estimated that the truck could have been idle since the night before, but let's go back to Nikki's 911 call. Uh, all right, Nikki, are you there? <laughs> Okay, we, we do have help on the way, okay? Just let me know when they're right there with you. Are, are you in your uh, blue Grand Am? Uh, I ain't in my car. You're in your car? Okay. Yeah. All right, and, and you're in the driveway right now? Yeah. Okay. Is there anyone there with you? No. 
operator told Nikki that she did the right thing by remaining outside and instructed her to wait in her vehicle until the emergency first responders arrived. 41-year-old Nikki can be heard crying hysterically for most of this call. She actually sounded quite a bit younger, in my opinion, than her age. And I thought to myself, I bet this operator might have thought she was a teenager. It was just the way that she sounded, and she would try to come off more calm when she had to answer questions. She said the last time she had contact with her husband was on Monday, and that they were in communication through phone. She kept repeating that she wanted to go inside the house, but of course the operator knew it was safer for Nikki to stay put, so he told her to wait until help arrived and reassured her they would be on their way. When she was asked if she saw smoke coming from the house, she said she could smell smoke, that it smelled really bad, but she couldn't see any smoke from where she was in the driveway inside her car, and she just kept sobbing and sobbing and asking, where are they, and to hurry. It wasn't always clear what she was saying besides that she wanted them to hurry. The operator kindly repeated that they were on their way, and finally, about seven minutes into the call, she said she finally sees someone coming. Let's listen. Okay. Okay. Yep, they're on their way. What's that? I'm sorry. They're going to be there as fast as they can. They're almost there. The bear tracks are here. The bear tracks are here now. Okay, do the, the fire trucks see you right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, uh, if you can safely just go to a fireman there, um, go and talk to them, okay? All right? Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. She sounds distraught. It's actually really hard to listen to with her just sitting there waiting and sobbing over and over again. I don't like to judge someone because I know they're in a traumatic situation because there's no right or wrong way to act. But I just made some observations while listening to that, as I'm sure all of you did as well. And I really wasn't sure what to think. When the firefighters finally arrived, the 911 dispatcher instructed Nikki to go and speak with them about what was happening. Jeremy Francis was the first one on the scene. He's a firefighter and a certified EMT for Bismarck. Nikki walked up and explained that she could not get into the home because of the smoke and thought her husband might be inside. He told her to wait there where she was. He proceeded to enter the garage and then the door into the mudroom. 
A light was on inside, and through the window to the door he could see a light smoky haze in the air. But as he went deeper into the home, he didn't see an active fire. That was a good thing, but of course he had to figure out where the smoke was coming from. Firefighter Francis and other firefighters reconvened outside before going back in to clear the home, room by room. What they observed right when they got into the house was soot covering surfaces of things like the washer, the dryer, and a black layer of soot about an inch or so thick. If you're watching, we'll be showing pictures of what they saw as they walked through the home. There was a sign that a fire had most likely been active at some point in the house for some time, so they continued making their way through the main level of the home, and they noticed soot in the kitchen, dining area, and downstairs bathroom. But there were still no signs of an active fire. But as they were continuing to make their way through the first level, down to the basement, where they got to the utility area where the furnace was located, and that's where they saw the first signs of where a fire had occurred. There was a pile of ash on top of the metal casing of the furnace. It was still slightly burning. It wasn't a big fire, but it was consuming the furnace. A hose was brought down and they put it out in less than a minute. The furnace was run through a propane tank outside, but the valve had melted off, so they had to use a pair of pliers to close it. Then they had the gas shut off for the rest of the house. It was running off the propane tank outside as well. They weren't done clearing the entire home. They had to make their way to the second floor. And that's when they noticed more soot and the smell of smoke increased. Three of the four bedrooms were on that level and they cleared one, then the other. However, as they got to the end of the hallway where the main bedroom was located, they noticed a closed door and the smoke smell increased even more. They opened the door to find themselves standing in a pitch black room that was so dark and smoky, they couldn't see just inches in front of their faces. It was so dark with all the soot that was covering everything, the walls, the floor, the ceiling. It was all black with a layer of thick smoke. Their flashlights wouldn't even illuminate enough to see just a few inches in front of them. They realized a fire had occurred in this space and that was where the majority of the damage was. But it had burned itself out due to a lack of oxygen because the door to the bedroom was closed and so were the windows. If it had been opened, this fire would have spread throughout the house and been a lot worse. Fires use up all the available oxygen until it starved itself and it'll just snuff itself out. So there was no need for firefighters to assist in getting the fire under control. They were just left standing among ash, soot, and burned items throughout this entire room. They knew they would need to start looking underneath all the ash and soot to make sure no one was still inside and had been killed. They also wanted to understand how this fire started, and that is when they noticed the 20-pound propane tank close to where the bed was located. That seemed strange. Then they realized it was attached to what's known as a sunflower heater. The valve was in the fully opened position, but the tank appeared to be completely empty. They closed the valve anyway, just to be safe. Now I learned something new every single case. I had never seen one of these types of heaters before, and we will show you what they look like if you're watching. They're designed to be used outside to heat small spaces or for something like a garage, but they're not meant to be indoors because they can be very dangerous. Not only can a fire start, but it lets off carbon monoxide, which isn't safe unless you can ventilate the space. So of course, this appeared to be the culprit of the fire at the home. Most of the damage in the room looked like it was to the bed and mattress. They began opening windows in the room and throughout the house to let out the smoke so that they could get a better view of the room. Once some of the smoke was cleared, they saw melted window blinds, charred bedding, black walls and floors, as well as a number of open and empty alcohol bottles. Crown Royale, Proper 12 Irish whiskey bottles just scattered around and charred. Then they make a disturbing discovery. A naked body, badly charred and burned, lying face up on the floor beside the bed. It appeared that the victim was a deceased male, and due to the level of damage and decomposition to the body, the firefighters knew there was no need for rescue efforts, and that is so sad. And of course, they do believe at this point, this is most likely Nikki's husband, 42-year-old Chad Ansel. At this point, firefighter Francis left the room, reported to the battalion chief on site, and told him that they found a victim. Since there was no active fire, but someone had died, they knew they would need to deliver the devastating news to Nikki, and to get investigators on the scene, because whether there's a casualty or not, every fire is investigated to find out the point of origin and the cause. However, reporters and media agencies had gotten word of the fire, and by that time, in a small town like this, 
it's big news. So people were surrounding Nikki. One of the reporters was even talking to her at the time. And out of respect, firefighters really didn't want to report anything over the radio that could be heard by the media and reported to Nikki before she spoke to them. However, before all that, the home needed to be fully ventilated so that the CO2 or other dangerous fumes like hydrogen cyanide that were present could all dissipate. Once it was cleared, they would call deputies and investigators to the scene. Running a fan in the house would take about 20 to 30 minutes to get the levels low enough. In the meantime, Officer Joseph Walker from the Burley County Sheriff's Office was dispatched to help control traffic so no cars could come down the road to the house. He sat at the corner in his patrol car and that's when a man pulled up. He introduced himself as Matthew Hines, Nikki Ensel's brother. Officer Walker was not aware of who Nikki was at the time, so he told him to please wait and he radioed up to the command. And they informed him that Nikki was one of the people who lived in the home. And they advised Officer Walker to allow Matthew to pull in and also have Nikki take a seat inside her brother's vehicle. That way she could be away from the scene and media until fire investigators, additional police officers, and the state fire marshal was on scene. Officer Walker was also advised that they needed to get a detailed written report from Nikki about what went on the last few days since she had not been in contact with her husband. This is a standard protocol to get a written statement ASAP so that the details are fresh in a person's mind. She was provided a paper and a pen and it took her about 20 minutes to complete her statement which was filled up about a page and a half. The officers and personnel on scene still had work to do before getting to Nikki so to keep her preoccupied, Officer Walker, who is a self-proclaimed chatterbox and was a rookie at the time, started to have some small talk with Nikki, just about who she was, her kids, and what she did for a living. He also needed to get consent from Nikki so that investigators could conduct a search of her home related to Chad's death. I don't think she was aware that he was deceased at this time, so he told her this was important considering they had noticed ammunition present on site. And that can be a hazard. If, if conditions are too hot or certain chemicals came in contact with any firearms or ammunition, it can cause an explosion. So of course, Nikki agreed to allow them to do anything they needed. Meanwhile, the fire marshal arrived with additional firefighters. They entered and they looked around the home and the main bedroom to get a preliminary understanding of how this fire could have happened. And that is when they noticed a shotgun sitting on the charred bed covered in soot. This fact, along with the propane tank, the sunflower heater, and the alcohol bottles, made it a pretty straightforward scene. The homeowner had taken his own life, perhaps drank excessively, which is common in the winter in this area of North Dakota, as we explained in the beginning, and he decided to start a fire with the intention of covering up the fact that he shot himself so that maybe his family would assume it was an accident or so his body would be so destroyed that no one would have to find him in that really traumatic condition. This is also not that uncommon, which is another sad fact, but this is what it looked like. And sadly, there are individuals who get to that point that they just want to end it, but they also don't want their family to find them in this horrific manner and then be affected for the rest of their lives. But I think no matter what, it would be traumatic, accident or not. And the firefighters took note of some other things. There were no smoke detectors sounding off throughout the house, but they noticed a security system in the mudroom. They weren't sure if it had any fire alert capabilities or if it was even in working condition. Outside, Officer Walker had built a rapport with Nikki. She told him all about her catering business, how she met her husband Chad, and explained that she hadn't seen him for a few days. Their furnace had been acting up for some time, and the cold was unbearable in the house, especially at night. And Nikki was actually unable to be comfortable in the home. So she was sleeping in her parked car out in the driveway with the heat on when the furnace wouldn't work. But then a few days ago, she said it fully conked out. Nikki couldn't handle the cold. And Chad didn't seem to have much of a problem with it. He could get by with a space heater, but she couldn't take it any longer. And since it wasn't getting fixed, Nikki was forced to stay in a nearby hotel, Staybridge Inn and Suites, until Chad got it taken care of. The last time she saw Chad was on Sunday, December 29th, but she said she came by the house the next day on Monday the 30th just to grab some extra clothes and some medicine. However, they only communicated by text that day. As they continued talking, Nikki told the deputy that she and Chad had only been renting the home since November 15th, less than two months. She insisted that they had made several complaints to the landlord about this broken furnace, but nothing had been done about it. 
She also shared that her two boys were staying with her parents for the remainder of the school holiday and had been away since December 20th, so they were not in town at the time. So it was easy for her to just be more comfortable and go to a hotel. After a few minutes of awkward silence, Nikki began to get even more chatty with Officer Walker. It was as though she couldn't allow the silence to linger very long, but it was a waiting game at this point, and she probably didn't know how to act. And it was good, because not only was this keeping her preoccupied, but it was also giving them context as to what was going on before the fire. As Officer Walker carefully pressed Nikki, she opened up about Chad. She said that more recently they had not been seeing eye to eye, and the furnace was the last straw. They had argued about it before she left. She said that they had some issues lately, which had drinking more than usual, and she wasn't comfortable with the way he would act. She tried to appease him at first, playing along when he told her he wanted to play some drinking games. According to Nikki, the drinking games were just Chad getting drunk and eventually getting to the point where he would rile her up. They'd argue, and he'd even gotten physical with her. Nikki said he'd hit her. She put up with it, but then it started to happen in front of her children, which prompted her to start thinking of a plan to get him help or she had to leave. She said she had expressed this to Chad's sister, Lori, and told Nikki that it might be a good idea to go to a counselor and talk about these kind of issues. Well, this added up to what was found inside the house, the numerous empty alcohol bottles, maybe the arguments, and Nikki staying away from Chad at the hotel caused him to become so upset and depressed he took his own life. Especially since Nikki confided in Officer Walker that she was planning on leaving if things didn't change. We're assuming she said the same thing to Chad during her arguments. Officer Walker described Nikki's demeanor as usual in these circumstances. And of course, the point came where Nikki had to be notified that there had been a fire in the home and that Chad was in fact inside and deceased. Remember, one of the concerns Nikki relayed to the 911 operator was that she thought her husband may be inside the home. So a part of her may have seen this coming. Again, her demeanor seemed normal for these circumstances as well. She was shocked and couldn't believe he was dead. At this point in time, they needed to get Nikki off the premises because they knew they would eventually need to remove Chad's body from the home, a sight they would not want any family member to witness. Nikki asked if she could retrieve some things from her vehicle. Unfortunately, it became part of the scene, which was categorized as a frozen scene at this time which meant nothing could be removed. Nikki had to get her a ride to her hotel room from her brother or someone else and reconnect with authorities later so that they could provide an update and she could eventually get her belongings. The next person notified that Chad had died was his sister Lori. A deputy and chaplain made their way to her home that night. As close as they were, Lori could not believe the news. And when she had to go to her mother's home with the deputies and the chaplain to tell Deb what happened, she just broke down. It was so much for her to take. Her only son, the light of her life, the one who never forgot her birthday, the one she'd just seen before Christmas would never smile, never laugh, and never hug her again. At this point, authorities had not made a determination about exactly how the fire started, and Chad would need to undergo an autopsy to confirm the official cause and manner of death. The same night on January 2nd, Sergeant Aaron Silbernagel from the Burley County Sheriff's Department went out to the scene. Now, it wasn't obvious from the outside that anything was wrong. When you hear about a fire, you usually think of walls caving in, roofs collapsing, and piles of ash remaining where a house had once been. But the home looked pretty normal, except for all the emergency vehicles outside. Chad was being transported to the medical examiner's office, and Sergeant Silbernagel met with Special Agent Derek Hill from ATF, and they began their own walkthrough of the scene, which included taking pictures of everything inside. There were over 600 pictures taken of this scene. They took note of the same things firefighters did, the propane tank, the sunflower heater, the one spent shell casing, and a shotgun on the bed. But about that, they had seen many self-inflicted deaths. And when someone shoots themselves with a gun, it's usually very close by. Sometimes it's even right underneath the victim. But in Chad's case, this over-under 12-gauge break-action shotgun was lying on the bed, while Chad's body was on the ground beside the bed. And not only that, it was the part of the bed where the gun was that was a little bit odd. If you're watching, we are going to put something on the screen that will explain this to you. But if you're looking in the bedroom, you see a bed right in front of you and up where the pillows are against the furthest wall to the left is where the gun was on the bed. But Chad's body was all the way on the right side off of the bed on the floor. 
So how did he get so far from the gun if he used it to shoot himself? When his body was still present at the scene, first responders could see some damage to his head, but because of the heat and the decomposition, it was really hard to determine if he had any gunshot wounds. So they wondered, was the gun even used at all? Or did it just happen to be there before maybe Chad decided to take another approach? Maybe use an accelerant near the heater to start a fire? There was still a possibility that somehow Chad had used the gun and maybe shot himself over on that side of the room and made his way over to the other side before falling to the ground. And to test this, they used a chemical called Blue Star and sprayed it all over the room. If blood is present, it will illuminate blue under an ultraviolet light. And the carpet to the left side of the bed closest to the shotgun light was bright blue. Droplets of blood were found on that side of the room. And there was a trail leading from the left side of the bed to the right where Chad was lying. As they continued to examine the room, they located the shotgun pellet holes in the wall behind the bed where the pillows were located, also closer to where the gun was. So it stands to reason that the gun was fired in that area of the room, and then somehow Chad's body ended up on the opposite side. In addition to this evidence, they located a bloody handprint on the wall. They took prints for it to be analyzed. Another interesting aspect of this case was the two separate fires, the one in the bedroom and the other in the basement. Two fires that were not connected. One didn't cause the other. This made it look like arson, and we know if Chad intended to take his life, this could have been part of his plan. He starts drinking, starts a fire in the furnace, proceeds upstairs to the bedroom, starts the bedroom fire, shoots himself, and then as the fire gets more intense, he passes out from both the gunshot and smoke inhalation. There are different categories for how a fire starts. First one would be categorized as natural. Some force of nature like a lightning bolt hitting a tree. Then there's accidental misuse when an item or appliance isn't operated correctly and it explodes or catches fire like maybe a gas stove. The third is an incendiary fire, which occurs in a place and time that it shouldn't. That's what arson is. The only other category is undetermined and that's when there are competing theories on the way it started. Here the burn pattern on the bed looks body as though something had been poured on it, maybe gasoline. But just to make sure, they call in an expert to locate ignitable liquid that could be used as an accelerant. His name is Webster. He's a special canine that could smell up to 60 different kinds of ignitable liquids. I love when they bring in a canine officer. It reminds me of the first case that we ever did, Kay Baker. Who remembers good old champ? Oh, champer. And now we have Webster and his handler, Shane Weltikall. It's so fascinating to me that Webster can smell up to 60 different kinds of ignitable liquids, and there only needs to be enough on the tip of a toothpick. So I learned something new, like I said, and dogs can smell in parts per billion, and humans can only detect the same odor in parts per million. A dog's sense of smell is about 10,000 to 100,000 times more acute than humans. Wow. And to put this in context, for example, a dog has the ability to detect one dirty item of clothing in a pile of 2 million clean ones. Amazing. I've also seen research that dogs can smell cancer and detect it in humans and other animals, which is just also really fascinating to me. So they let Webster into Chad and Nikki's home. And when he was led into the bedroom and given the command to find something, he exhibited a change in behavior, which is how he alerts to finding ignitable liquid. The places he was alerted were cut out and bagged and sent to the lab for further testing. And it turned out they were positive for medium distillate gas or lighter fluid. One of the items Webster alerted near was a piece of a label from a carton of marble red cigarettes. Now this was found right near the furnace and it was believed that a cigarette carton was used to start this fire, possibly put on top where the furnace was located, where there was a pile of ash. The thing is, that neither Chad nor Nikki smoked cigarettes. They also found a welding iron too, and it appeared it was in the on position. So they took photos and they collected that as well for evidence. These things will of course come into play later in the case. But one officer put it this way, he said, when there's enough crumbs on the ground, you're gonna find your way home. And I love that. Those breadcrumbs are the evidence left behind and each piece will lead them to the truth about what happened. They just had to follow the clues. And Webster kind of cracked the case in a way. Now they know that this was not an accidental fire. They confirmed their suspicions. But who started it? Was it Chad 
or was it someone else? Next, they re-examined the bedroom with this new evidence in mind, and the investigators were looking for anything that proved either Chad set the fire or that someone else did. As investigators go back inside the room and are now removing more evidence for collection and examination, they pick up the shotgun and the alcohol bottles and get a very telling piece of evidence. There are perfect outlines underneath where the bedding is not burned. It didn't have soot on it and had been preserved because of the presence of bottles and the gun on top of it. This means, for instance, that the shotgun had been on the bed in this position when the fire was started. Same with the bottles. But of course, the shotgun is more important. If Chad had started the fire and then shot himself, there wouldn't be an outline like this. The fire would have already burned that part. At the very least, there would be ash or soot there. They're still waiting for the autopsy results to determine if Chad had any gunshot wounds. But what they notice is that when they look over at where his body had been lying, the same outline is present. The floor is completely preserved where Chad's body was. Again, this means that he was on the floor in the position before the fire started. Now investigators know that Chad was not the one that started the fire. They need to check all these things off to figure out exactly what happened here. When they lifted up the propane tank, they also noticed distinctive ring marks on the floor in soot with different layers and densities underneath it. If Chad was dead, this meant someone moved the propane tank. It clearly wasn't Chad. The propane tank had been moved several times because there had actually been several arson attempts. And you may be wondering how they knew that there was more than one attempt to start a fire in the bedroom. Well, that theory started with the fire in the basement near the furnace that appeared to have been started twice, once with a cigarette carton and once with the smoldering welding iron. Each time the fire burned out due to lack of oxygen. Now, a novice arsonist probably wouldn't know that if you close the doors and the windows, a fire will burn out. And it's morbid to say this, but it also appeared there were some attempts to set Chad's actual body on fire. And there were marks near and on his body that indicated someone attempted to light around and on him. Novice arsonists, again, have this mistaken belief that a body is good fuel, but they're not, especially if they aren't wearing any clothing and Chad was naked. The heaviest area of fire damage was on the wall behind the bed where the damage from the gunshot pellets were. So it was determined that an ignitable fluid was also used in accelerant in this area because of the V pattern on the wall. And that accelerant was also used on the bed and the floor surrounding where Chad's body had been and Webster alerted. The lighter fluid was most likely used after the failed attempts to get the room to burn, and it was believed the fire on the wall had been started to cover up the blood and the birdshot pellets that were embedded in the wall. Now, when re-examining the blood in the area, it appeared to be more of a cleanup attempt, especially with the bloody handprint and the blood on the floor from one side of the bed to the other where Chad's body was. It looked like it could have been drag marks. Wow, so a picture was starting to emerge and it conflicted with the one that Nikki had kind of tried to paint of Chad being this abusive drunk. So days go on, a lot is being done in this investigation, clues are emerging, and notes from the other officer's reports are being combed through. Remember Nikki had spoken to that Officer Walker in the driveway when she was sitting in her brother's car? Well, his report about everything Nikki revealed to him was very interesting. While you already heard about Chad's alleged drinking games where he would get plastered and then argue with Nikki, remember she claimed he also hit her. When she was relaying this to the officer, she just happened to have a photo ready to pop up and show him. Now, I'm going to put it on the screen, but I'm not sure what it's supposed to be showing here because to me, it looks like someone that had a whole bunch of grocery bags on their forearm. I know those marks are always on mine when I try to carry them, but she showed him a few more pictures. The thing is, she only showed body parts, legs, arms, necks with no face. These weren't selfies of Nikki with big black eyes and nothing like that. So Officer Walker believed that she had maybe just screenshot them from the internet. And they weren't of her at all because they looked like they could have been from many different people. None of the photos were consistent with Nikki's current body type either. So the deputy felt like Nikki had actually planned to show him these pictures. That's suspicious. And this was supposed to be proof that Chad was terribly violent. And she claimed that one of the reasons that she didn't want to stay and go to the hotel was because he hit her and because of the freezing conditions in the home. 
But there was more. She almost excitedly shared more of her plans with Officer Walker, almost like she was bragging or even trying to impress him. It was borderline flirtatious. Nikki talked about how she had a plan to move to Texas and start a new life without Chad. She even quickly pulled up a bunch of websites showing really nice homes out in Texas. She told the deputy she had several job interviews in Texas in the next few weeks. So at this point, she asked if he would retrieve an Amazon box from her vehicle. He asked what was in the box. And she actually admitted that she had purchased new cell phones. I wonder why she would need a new cell phone. Maybe she knew beforehand that her phone would be taken away as evidence? Hmm. I don't know. You're kind of going out of your way there to set up an entirely new account and a new phone. It's just weird and so random that she would be telling this police officer all this. Right. But there could also be an innocent explanation. Well, it wasn't looking good. All signs were pointing to Nikki trying hard to make her now deceased husband look bad and to make her look like the real victim. When Officer Walker asked Nikki if they could search her house, remember that? He claimed it was because they saw ammo inside and wanted to ensure nothing would explode. Well, as soon as Walker mentioned guns, Nikki offered some information. She commented that she wasn't good with guns, and she didn't know which kind of guns they had. Officer Walker needed clarification on what she meant. Was she saying she wasn't comfortable around firearms, or she didn't have experience with them? Either way, he thought it was pretty odd. Right, because... She was kind of saying like, oh, she wouldn't know how to shoot one. And this was before Nikki was given any information about what was found inside the home. They hadn't told her that a shotgun was on the bed near Chad's body. So this seemed really odd and telling. And there's even more. Officer Walker was really playing into her trusting him. Yeah, he was so good at building rapport. He would reveal things about his own life in an attempt to get Nikki to open up, and it worked. Exactly. One of those moments was when Walker got an alert on his phone. When he checked on it, he commented to Nikki that it was his home security system. He said he was excited to install all these new cameras inside and outside his residence, but because the system would alert him of every little movement, he started to become desensitized to it and doesn't even bother checking when he gets an alert now. And he was joking with Nikki, telling her it kind of defeats the purpose of having cameras if you don't look at them to see what's going on. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of Steve the Spider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From the studio, there is this large, like, cobweb, and it gets inside of our cameras, and it sets it off. I'm like, babe, someone's in the studio. And then we look, and it's just this cobweb. And so now, now every time I see that notification, I'm like, oh, it's just the yeah, spider Yeah, we're like, oh, it's the spider web. It's so like, I totally understand that. Yeah, why don't we just clean it? Probably because it's like 20 feet up in the air in a very weird spot. So after Walker said this, Nikki piped up right away, agreeing with Walker, but also offering up some more information. She said something to the effect of, oh yeah, there are cameras outside our house, but if you move and duck in a certain way, they won't trigger the system. Why would you even offer that information? I really do see how all of this looks like she's bragging like, oh, I'm so smart. I can fool the security system. But at this time, Walker uses this as a way to gain even more information about that security system, kind of pretending to want to know if maybe hers is a good one in case he wants to switch. But eventually, the information she provides indicates that the security system in the home records movement on an outdoor camera, and it also keeps track of when anyone opens and closes doors in the home. So that could provide investigators with a really good timeline of events and who was coming and going the last few days without having to rely solely on what Nikki tells them. So they plan to contact the security company to gain access to those records. And meanwhile, the investigators go into Nikki's car and they retrieve that box that she wanted. And when they look at the address label for where the phones were sent, it wasn't in Chad or Nikki's name or at their address. It was for someone named Earl Howard. So the officers, they take a photo of the label, but they're wondering, who is Earl? And they don't know, but they take note of his name. At this point, Nikki had painted a picture for investigators of a depressed, abusive, alcoholic man who had killed himself after setting a fire. And on its face, her theory rang true. But upon a closer examination, her entire story quickly began to fall apart. It was time to find out from Chad's closest friends and family if there was any truth to what Nikki claimed. Well, none of his close friends that he bowled with said that Chad was ever angry. It was quite the opposite. He was always happy. And they never once saw him depressed. None of them had ever witnessed him drink in excess either. 
Chad's mother, who was a complete wreck after her son's passing, said she never saw Chad get angry to a point of ever becoming physical. His sister said the same thing, that of course they had gone into verbal disagreements growing up, but he never, ever attempted to strike her. Now, remember that Chad has an ex-wife and they were together for 17 years. She also provided information about her experience with Chad while they were married. She remembered when she found out that Chad was dead. One of her friends told her that there had been a house fire in Bismarck, and of course, that's where Chad lived, so it piqued her interest. She turned on the news to hear them say that there was one fatality, Chad Edsel, and her first thought was, why wasn't he able to get out of that house? It didn't make sense to her. What also didn't make sense was what Nikki had told investigators. Susie said Chad was never depressed, and he would have never taken his own life, not in a million years. And he wasn't an alcoholic, and he would never hit a woman. She was like, he would never touch a woman like that, ever. She told them point blank that Nikki was lying. But Nikki was still running that story. When she called Chad's sister, Lori, she was hysterical on the phone. Lori said she could hardly get words out, but she made sure to relay that she was convinced that Chad had killed himself. One way they could narrow down who might have been home when the fire occurred was to check the cameras at Chad and Nikki's. Investigators were attempting to create a timeline for the hours before Chad's death. During the winter, Chad would go play darts with friends at a sports bar on Wednesday night, and on Monday and Thursday, he had a bowling league. Well, Nikki said the last time she saw Chad was on Sunday, December 29th, when they argued about the furnace. She said she went to stay at the Staybridge Suites Hotel, but she went home on the 30th to get some clothes and medicine. So investigators pulled the footage from the morning on Monday to see if Chad had ever left the house. Let's start with what's on the camera at 728 on Monday, December 30th. There's Chad's truck parked in the driveway and Nikki pulls into the garage. She's inside for about 10 minutes and then at 737 AM, her car is pulling out of the driveway and she's heading to work. At 742 AM, Chad comes out to his truck and starts it probably to warm it up. 10 minutes later, he's pulling away and heading to work. Then at 5.07 p.m., Chad pulls back in after work to change and get ready for bowling. He heads to Midway Lanes at 5.46 p.m. But what the camera catches next is interesting. Nikki did say she came back to grab clothes and medicines, but you'd assume she did that when she arrived at 7.37 a.m. However, the camera captures a white pickup truck pulling into that driveway at 6.54 p.m. That's not Chad's truck. He's still at the bowling alley, but a man is seen getting out of the truck and walking towards the house. Then the car pulls into the garage where Nikki had pulled out earlier that morning. It stays there until almost 7 p.m. when it's seen pulling out of the garage. However, it stops and it doesn't leave the premises. Now the man is getting out once again. And he's smoking a cigarette and then he throws it on the ground and we know that Nikki and Chad don't smoke. And that the basement fire was started with a piece of a cigarette carton, so is this who did it? It's definitely a lead. And at 8 p.m., the same man is seen loading things into the truck and then returning to home. Now, I have not seen Nikki on camera, so I'm sitting here wondering, who is this guy? Just wait. At 8.26, there's Nikki. Okay, so she must have gotten out of the truck when they pulled it into the garage. Yeah, and now she and the man are both seen getting back into the truck. The man goes to the house one more time before he returns, and the truck finally pulls out of the driveway at 8.27 p.m., but that was the last video on the system. So investigators need to find out when Chad returned and where he was, so they pulled the footage from Midway Lanes, and they saw him pull in just before 6 p.m. He doesn't leave the bowling alley until after 10 p.m. There's footage of him walking out the door and proceeding to his truck in the parking lot, so it's odd that there's no video footage from the security cameras at the home of Chad pulling in. What would it show? Was someone waiting for him? Did they disable the cameras? Well, investigators contact a security system company, representatives from New Vision Security, and request access to all the records for Nikki and Chad's account. These records have time and date stamped activity logs for everything that is happening with the security cameras. But it will take some time for investigators to sift through all of them. And in the meanwhile, investigators reach out to Chad's workplace to find out whether he came in on Tuesday the 31st. That is New Year's Eve. Interstate power was closed on the 1st, so no one would have been there that day. But Chad wasn't in the day before either. And what's even more interesting is that they have a record that Chad was marked absent due to illness. And remember, Nikki did mention to the 911 operator that Chad had been sick. Well, it would seem that this would all add up. Chad not showing up at work because he's sick and Nikki mentioning it. 
But it turned out that it wasn't Chad that called in to take the day off. It was Nikki. Now that is odd. And it was totally out of the ordinary. If he was too sick to get on the phone, that would make sense. I mean, yes, she is his wife. But according to his friends, they saw him the night before, late night, right before 11 p.m., and he was fine. So he just somehow so sick the day afterward between going to bed and waking up that morning that he has to have his wife call him in sick? I don't know. It looks really suspicious. The only time that I have personally had anyone call me in sick was when I was lying. I'm not going to lie now, but when I was a teenager, I would have my friends in high school call in and pretend they were my mom. But actually, if I'm being really honest, I was the one that was always pretending to be someone else's mother because I had a deeper voice. So I would do the mom voice. Do it. I'm not proud of it. Like, hello, this is Victoria's mom. I'm just calling in. She's not feeling well today. Yeah. I'm just going to keep her home. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye now. Like I would always do like, <laughs> it's terrible. But this is suspicious that Nikki called him in to work. And he's not seen again up until the point he's found dead in a fire that he didn't start. So the next day on the first was a holiday, so his work was closed. But by the second, when Chad never showed up and they didn't get another call that he was out sick, that's when his coworkers called Nikki and then went over to his place and eventually called for a wellness check. And you know the rest. By this time, it's now January 6th, four days after Chad has been found dead. And guess who calls the sheriff's office? Nikki herself. She requested to go back in the house so she could retrieve some of her things. She needed to be escorted by an official, so Sergeant Silbernagel agreed to meet her over there. But he also decided that this was a great opportunity for him to record audio. This was a chance for the sergeant to walk through the actual scene with Nikki and to maybe ask her some questions. What he really wanted to know was who was the man who was with her on the house the night of the 30th. So they meet at the house and proceed to make their way inside. Silbernagel wanted to get Nikki's timeline as well. So as she was packing things up, he used this as an opportunity to kind of ask her how she was alerted that something may have been wrong with Chad. And she repeated the whole story about the furnace not working. She even pulled up a video of the furnace. It's a short video kind of just showing that it would go out as soon as she tried to put it on. This is what led to her and Chad getting into that argument and her deciding to leave and stay at a hotel. Then the coworker started asking if she knew where Chad was. She said she texted Chad that afternoon and she showed Silbernagel her phone with the text. It was sent at 2.29 p.m. on January 2nd and it said, quote, worked called, said you not been there all day. What are you doing? Your drinking game and forgot you have to work? Question mark. End quote. She showed that she had got no response. And about 10 seconds later, she texted again saying, quote, this is nuts. End quote. The next thing that happened were the coworkers telling her they were at the house and Chad's truck was there, but he wasn't answering. She told them she would check right after work. And I'm sitting here thinking, you couldn't take the seven minute drive from your work in an emergency and unlock the door and check on your husband? Mm -hmm. Because you would think your work would understand, like my, my husband's not answering, he's been sick. And that is why I think people thought this was suspicious. And it's only going to be a 30 minute round trip, you know? I mean, maybe not even. And and who cares? It's an emergency. Someone's not answering. That was suspicious. All of this was, especially letting a whole day go by in the sergeant's mind and not reaching out. Nikki explained that not only did they not text much when they were arguing, but Nikki claimed they purposely never texted about fights and things like that because they wanted to appear on the outside to have the perfect relationship. Oh, and that's really convenient because now I'm assuming they won't find any evidence of text that Nikki sent to Chad of her threatening to leave because of him drinking or addressing the times that she claimed that he's hit her and given her bruises. And again, I think it's just very convenient. And just like with Officer Walker, Nikki was once again very chatty with Silbernagel. And I think she believes that she can somehow entrance men or something. Like she can get them under her spell by using the baby voice and the giggling. And it really reminded me of another famous Nikki. Hi. Chris Watts' mistress, Nicole Kessinger. If you know, you know. That is a laugh that I will never forget. <laughs> but let's go back to this, Nikki. As they walked through, she pointed out the gun sock in the bar area during the visit. 
It's the one that goes over the shotgun that was later found in the room with Chad's body. She said that's not usually there. And it just happens to be right near the bar. It's like Chad was drinking and then he unsheaths his gun and then goes upstairs with it. Exactly. The bar was of interest to Silbernagel. Not because of that. It was because there wasn't much alcohol in it. For someone who's a drunk, there really wasn't much. Only a couple bottles of wine and one looked almost empty. But on the other hand, if someone is a heavy drinker, maybe they would have empty bottles because they drank all the alcohol, but you would think that they would have a lot more on hand. Right, but they only found two bottles in Chad's room, one bottle of Crown Royal and one of Proper 12. But as they got closer to the bar, Nikki inquired why the bar was broken. Silbernagel explained that the firefighters couldn't see as they were attempting to locate anyone inside the smoky home, and the front portion of the bar area broke. It had been open, and things on it like a cigar box was now on the floor. Silbernagel also asked about the security system whether it was in working condition. Nikki explained that it was brought over from their previous home, and it doesn't work well. It's always going off. Things don't work, and it will alert when no one is there. It's just very temperamental and not reliable. But Silbernagel still wants to know if they had it since they moved in, and Nikki said yes, and that she usually checks it from an app on her phone. She showed him the app and opened it to show the activity log. Silbernagel knew that they need to collect her phone as evidence which was done by the end of this trip. And that's interesting how she always has an excuse for everything. Now it's the security system that it doesn't work really well. Almost setting up another excuse if they were to find anything on the records. Or if they don't find something. Right, because already remember, there were no videos of Chad coming home from the bowling alley. I wonder why. Was it that the system wasn't working or did someone who had access possibly delete that video? Sounds a bit too convenient. You'd think that anyone who knows anything about technology knows there's always a record of everything, even a record of a deletion. So it's kind of dumb to tamper with something like that, unless you're too dumb to think about it. But this was a good time for Silbernagel to kind of probe about Nikki's coming and goings. And he asked her about coming over to the house on the 30th. Now that she knows that they're going to check her security system information and not knowing they had already retrieved and viewed the camera footage, she admitted that she came over later that night when she knew Chad would be bowling so that she wouldn't have to have a confrontation with him while retrieving her things. When asked if she came alone, Nikki said, no, I brought a friend with me. She was just saying it so nonchalantly, just for safety, she wanted someone there. So Silbernagel asked who the friend was. And Nikki said, oh, Earl. And Silver Nigga was like, who is he? Is he a friend of the families? And Nikki said, oh yeah, it's a friend of her and Chad's. Silver Nagel asked if Earl is local to the area. And Nikki said, no, he actually lives out in Canada. That he's a contractor and comes into town for work. And he was in town. So she asked for his assistance, but he's now back home in Canada. He was just there for a few days. So Silbernagel is playing along, but he is very suspicious. An out-of-town friend of the family happens to be in town exactly when Nikki gets into an argument with Chad, and he's both of their friends, but he's helping Nikki remove things from the home. Before Silbernagel can inquire further, he's interrupted by a phone call. So he steps away. It's one of the other investigators informing him that Dr. Masello, the state medical examiner, was in the middle of performing the autopsy on Chad's body, but he's already ruled Chad's death a homicide. Wow, but that's not really a surprise to me, but just wow that the call came in right then. Dr. Mazzello found out that Chad indeed had shotgun wounds, plural, two of them. Quite hard to shoot yourself twice with a shotgun, especially since the doctor concluded that both shots would have been fatal. One entered his left upper tricep area, exited the shoulder, and re-entered on the left side of his head. The second shot was entered from behind and below the left ear at the back of the neck, entering the base of the skull. Wow, so at this point there's no doubt Chad was killed, because yeah, it would be really hard to shoot yourself twice with a shotgun. Especially in that configuration. And it was at that moment that Silbernagel knew he was probably standing in the same room as Chad's killer. So he knew he had to tread lightly about what he asked when he hung up that phone. Instead of telling her that he knew anything, Silbernagel played into Nikki's victim act. He comforted her, saying he was so sorry she had to walk through the scene where her husband died. She began sobbing and sobbing, and Silbernagel just went along with it. 
This was to continue to have rapport with her, and eventually he ended up being able to collect her phone, including the passcode to open it and the information needed to access the security app. Right, but you know this woman has had ample time to tamper with everything on there, to erase things and leave only what she wants them to find. It's clear she thinks that she has thought of everything. But wait, because this is when things start getting really crazy. They pull up all the information on the security app and guess what? There had been a video clip from the driveway on December 30th at 10 35 PM, but it was deleted. That was most likely Chad pulling in after the bowling alley. Then the garage door sensor was activated a minute later at 10 36 That was Chad going into the garage and presumably inside the home because the garage door closes that same minute. But then at 1.11 a.m., the garage door is opened again and it isn't closed until close to 3 a.m. Hmm. And when it is opened up again, it's 6.27 a.m. and there's no video because that was actually deactivated manually. Nikki had full access to the controls on everything related to that security system, and in no way did it look like it was broken or didn't work well. She could manually deactivate things and erase things as well. Her name was next to any actions that she did. Chad's name was on the system, but it looked like he really didn't pay much attention to it, and there were just so many times that Nikki goes into the app and changes things like the driveway settings, and even puts on privacy mode so that the cameras don't record. It's right there on all the activity records. Wow. Wow. Since they know that Nikki was staying at the Staybridge Inn in Suisse, which is only a nine-minute drive away from her and Chad's home, the investigators go there to speak with the staff and try to retrieve surveillance footage to see if they spot Nikki and her little family friend coming and going. They pull up footage from December 29th, and sure enough, they finally see Nikki and the guy they assume is Earl coming into the side door of the hotel at 2 a.m., and it looked like they were carrying a lot of luggage. They probably went through this door to bypass the lobby, and get this, when the investigators asked the receptionist if she recognized Nikki, she said yes, and then he asked if the receptionist saw anything out of the ordinary. She said not really, other than her and the man she was with asking for new key cards to be made a couple of times. But actually, she also mentioned that one day, Nikki came to the front desk asking about the hotel's video cameras. There you go. She claimed that she lost a piece of jewelry and wanted to know if the cameras could possibly catch anything. And the receptionist told her that they only had cameras in the lobby and the main part of the hotel and not on any of the other floors. However... They also had cameras on the public areas and outside entrances. I don't think Nikki understood that. And I can't help but think, wow, isn't it so obvious? Don't we all know that hotels have cameras and that they can track your key card activity? That's what the investigators asked for next. And right then and there, the receptionist was able to let them see a machine that records the date and time that keys are used. This is all going to be very telling, but going back to that camera footage from Sunday, December 29th, why are they together at two o'clock in the morning? Remember she told investigators that she and Chad argued the day of the 29th about the furnace? Well, this was early that morning on the 29th and she's already at the hotel. So that's not really adding up. And they both go in together and they don't come back out. So I mean, I think they're probably staying together. And she said this was a family friend. Hours later, at 10 a.m., Earl is seen coming out to smoke a cigarette, and then he returns with a bunch of clothing and items and then goes back into the hotel. About an hour later, at 11.17, Earl leaves again with another bag, and he's seen smoking a cigarette. And then Nikki, she pops up at the door, just waiting for him. You can see her through the glass. They're probably talking through the door at this time. And finally, at 11.20, Earl goes back in, and him and Nikki go further into the hotel, only to reemerge a minute later together and leave. Later, at 4.27 p.m., Earl is seen carrying a bunch of boxes and things and coming back into the hotel. At 4.32, he leaves again. And a couple minutes later, he's back with more stuff. And this just goes on and on. It's like they are moving into this hotel, just back and forth to his truck, bring items in and out. But this time he is with Nikki and they go inside together. And then Earl is back minutes later. And again, it's the back and the forth bringing things in and out, maybe from both his truck and Nikki's car at this time. 
But this time, the dumbass realizes that he forgot his key card. So we see him enter the main lobby. And he asks the person at the front desk to make him a new one. And then he just disappears around the corner. Just before 6 p.m., Earl once again comes out of the side door carrying a bag of stuff. He comes back five minutes later and goes back inside. Then a few minutes later at 6.13, both Earl and Nikki come out together. And remember, this is still Sunday, December 29th, the day Nikki claims she and Chad got into an argument about the furnace and she was forced to get a hotel. She looks really forced, especially coming back to the hotel with Earl hours later at four o'clock in the damn morning. Just a few hours later, Nikki will be coming over to her and Chad's place. And that footage that we have on Monday morning, the 30th of her pulling in, going inside for 10 minutes. And she says that was to talk to Chad about having to stay at the hotel. But she has been out all night with Earl. Earl doesn't reemerge until later in the afternoon the next day on Monday at close to 4 p.m. Still, we know that Nikki is caught on the home camera footage that morning before 8, hence she probably went through the hotel lobby since that would go well with her story. She stayed at the hotel the night before and went to work the next day. Seems as though Earl is just doing his own thing that day while Nikki is at work. He comes and goes a couple times and then Nikki returns alone at 524, probably after she's done with work. But the dumbass can't get her card to work either, so it seems like she may have to call Earl because he comes down a few minutes later and they both go in together at 6.30 p.m. They both leave together minutes later and they do not return until 10.06 p.m. and they appear to be carrying a bunch of grocery bags. We know that they were both seen on camera over at Nikki and Chad's house loading things into Earl's truck that night for about an hour, pulling in at 6.54 p.m. So they most likely drove from the hotel over to the house. The security data shows that the garage door opened after 10 p.m., which was most likely Chad, because Nikki and Earl are seen inside the hotel at this time. Earl leaves at 10.32 p.m. to retrieve more stuff from his truck. And this goes on, like we said the other time, back and forth for a little while, both Earl and Nikki going back and forth, bringing things in. Most likely all the stuff that they retrieved from inside Nikki's. So maybe he was just helping her move things because remember, she said that she planned to leave Chad. Or maybe this was to salvage her things from being burned in a fire. The next time they actually leave together is at 1.02 a.m. And this time is important. Because only nine minutes later, guess what happens on the security system? The garage door opens at 1.11 a.m. at Chad's. Hmm. Take a wild guess who it was that opened it. And it closes at 2.56 a.m. And then Nikki just happens to return to the hotel at 3.18. Do the math. With Earl coming in an hour later. That is not a coincidence. They were in that house and probably killing Chad maybe even attempting to start a fire. But we know there were multiple attempts and this first one failed because we know it wasn't until January 2nd that Nikki calls 911 about smoke. That next morning, Chad doesn't show up at work and no one sees him until he's found deceased. Nikki calls him out of work sick, come on. It's so obvious that they killed him. And it's so cold and calculated. Definitely calculated because when investigators ask for hotel records for the room that was booked by Nikki, they don't find a reservation until January 3rd, as if she's just started staying there following Chad's death. You mean Chad's murder? And I agree. It's like she just wants to make it look like, oh, I had, I was forced again to get this hotel room. But yes, they only find a record under her name starting on January 3rd and going until the 8th. However, when the investigators ask her records for the name Earl Howard, they find something interesting. They see that Earl's reservation actually started on December 12th with a checkout date of December 14th. So he was just there for a couple days earlier in the month. His next reservation was December 28th with the original checkout day, December 30th, but it was changed after the fact and he extended his stay until when? January 2nd. Interesting. It's obvious that Nikki was staying with him in his room until she got one of her own and he left after their little deed was done. It's disgusting. And investigators know that they're not just friends. So they do more digging and they find out there was another hotel reservation at the same hotel from Earl 
way back in October. He checked in on October 23rd, 2019 and stayed a few days. So was this just for work? How long has he really known Nikki? Did they meet? That's what investigators want to find out. So they run a background check on him. And it turns out Earl was born in North Dakota. He's got family out in Texas and he met a woman in Canada and they got married. So he moved out there. They have a child together who is actually nine years old when he's sitting there gallivanting with Nikki and most likely helping her kill Chad. They started to pull up Nikki and Earl's financial records, and that's when they see some purchases at a nearby Walmart. So they get the footage from the time period, and the first one is December 29th at 1 p.m. They're seen leaving with a cart full of stuff. And wait for it. Earl is kindly helping Nikki put on her jacket, but then they actually kiss in this clip. That's a kiss, right? Mm -hmm. Of course it is. And they are definitely more than friends, as if we needed more evidence of that. But then at 11.30 p.m., they're back there once again, walking in together and walking out with a bag of something. And they're holding hands at 11.47 p.m. How can they just act like nothing is happening? Like they're not just about to go kill someone, like a man is not going to die. Well, as detectives dug further, they found out that both Nikki and Earl bought plane tickets together the weekend before the murder. According to text messages, Nikki told her husband she was going through a company-wide training and would be gone that weekend doing that. Instead, she was with Earl out in Minnesota. Then they both flew back to Bismarck, and when Earl reserved the Staybridge Hotel on December 28th, Nikki was with him. Wow. Incredible. I mean, I'm not surprised, but she has just been lying and lying. Yeah, and she's been setting up the entire story for a while. Investigators look through her phone and they find texts between her and a friend named Michelle Mundy, which were back on December 10th. At first, Nikki and Michelle were having some small talk about Nikki moving into her new house and Michelle coming out to visit soon. But then it turns into Nikki telling Michelle that she wishes she moved into this new place without Chad. So Nikki tells Michelle that Chad came home with claw marks on his neck. She says that she should have taken pictures. She's implying that Chad is out messing with another woman and that she left his mark on him. So Michelle was like, WTF? And Nikki said, yep, we're in different rooms now. And Michelle wants to know who the hell was he with? Was it his ex? And Nikki says, I don't know. I heard it was some chick at the bowling alley. Then Michelle calls Chad a loser. And of course, she's apologizing to Nikki. And then Nikki tells her that she and Chad hadn't slept together in over two years. Wow. That she stopped having sex with him because he had issues with his ex. Well, Michelle just agreed with Nikki and tells her that she doesn't blame her and then tells her she hopes to see her when she's out that way. But then just days later, she's confiding in Michelle about hanging out with some guy named Roy. Well, during this investigation, it's discovered that Roy is Earl's middle name. And Nikki refers to Earl as Roy with her friends. So she sends a picture to Michelle and says she loves what Roy got her. It was a boot spur that he hung on her rear view mirror. We're going to show you a picture of it if you're watching. And then let's jump to December 26 in the text messages. Nikki sends a picture to Michelle that's supposed to be, get this, just look at this picture if you're watching. It's supposed to be black eyes. I'm looking at it. And to me, it looks like eyeliner or like eyeshadow. Like she rubbed her eyes. It doesn't look like bruises, but of course, Michelle is shocked. But Nikki tells her it's going to get better because Roy promised. And the texts go on and on talking about how Chad's going to get what's coming to him. And then Nikki and Earl are going to go legal on him. They're going to get a restraining order. And then the court is going to kick Chad out of the house within 48 hours of him being served. That Roy has it all figured out. Oh, I am sure he does. And that's not all they found on her phone. There's way too much to even mention, but we didn't want to forget about a particular video the investigators found. Okay, wait a minute. Let me provide some context. We know that it's close to the holiday when all this is going on. They find an email from Earl to Nikki on December 14th with a link to a YouTube video and the videos of a husband and wife. And the wife is complaining to her husband that she didn't get a good enough Christmas present. As she's storming out of the house, she sees this brand new car in the driveway with a big red bow and the husband hands her the keys. But watch what happens next. (laughs) 
if you just watch that, the wife gets into the car and she starts it and the whole car blows up. And then the husband says, Merry Christmas, bitch. Wow. So of course, the investigators thought that this was very telling. And one more thing that I thought of, after Chad is found deceased, Nikki tells Michelle that they won't let her see his body because this is so gross. In her words, she said he was crispy. Crispy. That is how she described her husband, a man that she claims to love. Another piece of evidence they found was a picture in Nikki's phone of what the bar area looked like before the fire. The picture was taken on December 7th, and interestingly, it shows it open the way it was before the firefighters went in that day and broke it. Inside, there's two bottles of hard liquor. Can you guess which ones? I would guess it's the Crown Royal and the Proper 12. Yep, those two bottles are sitting in the back, and you can see the Crown Royal is already almost empty. There wasn't much left for him to drink. So he wouldn't be wasted and forget to go to work or even get to the point of being that drunk. And we know he wasn't, or at least we know he didn't kill himself in a drunken stupor. And it was most likely that he was ambushed while he was asleep at one o'clock in the morning. That's why the pellets are right above the pillow area behind the bed. They most likely came in and just shot him while he was in bed, then tried to burn the bed and the wall to hide the evidence. Poor Chad, this is so messed up. I mean, why not just get a divorce? I don't know. But after finding all this, Silbernagel knows he needs to call her back for an interview. So the very next day, on January 7th, he gets in touch with Nikki and tells her he needs to finalize his reports. It's a standard procedure, so would Nikki mind coming in to tie up some of those loose ends? Silbernagel goes back over Nikki's version of events and everything remains the same. She's still playing the victim, saying that Chad is always out of the house, even five nights or more a week. She asked him if they could do things together, but he refused or made excuses, and then he started drinking a lot, in excess. This all started two years ago. She's just sobbing and explaining how bad things were getting, and how he began to get physical with her, and she even grabbed Silvernagel's arm to show how Chad would grab her. All the while, he was playing along, acting as though he truly believed her. He asked her how much he drinks. Nikki says he drinks two cases of whiskey a month, one case of Crown, and one case of Proper 12, plus beers. Again, it's conveniently the same type of alcohol that was found in the house, the bottles that were found in the room. And if you do the math, that would mean this man drank a bottle of whiskey a day, every day, every month. And the average person would not be able to maintain a job. They wouldn't be able to drive. And they certainly wouldn't be able to play a perfect game of bowling. And we know his friend said they never saw him wasted like that. So how would this be the truth? And all the alcohol was not even found in the home. Only those two bottles in the bedroom and a couple bottles of wine left in the bar. So let's play some of this interview, even though... It's not the best quality. I think you'll be able to make out exactly what's going on. At least you'll get an idea of their demeanor. Like how much would you say they produced? You would make me drink a whole bottle of crown. You would drink a whole bottle of crown and have a bottle of pepper sauce and maybe. She just sobs and sobs and plays the victim saying he's always drinking. They can't even enjoy holidays together. Come on. It's so much drinking. When in reality, when they talked to Chad's family, his mom and sister said it was Nikki who left the last Christmas dinner early and arrived late. She came to Lori's on the 21st about an hour after Chad arrived, and she didn't even stay more than about an hour. Instead, she left, saying that she wanted to work out at the gym. Chad was the one that stayed and socialized with the family, not Nikki. So again, this victim story doesn't add up at all. Silbernagel also asked Nikki about Earl, and she says he was a customer of her catering business. He became a regular, and she and Chad became friends with him, and that Chad actually hung out with him. Then he shifts the conversation to finances, asking Nikki if she's doing okay with everything money-wise and is okay paying for the hotel. Still, he slips in a question about how long she's been renting the room, and she says only since January 3rd and adds that insurance is covering it. This will become another aspect of this case, and I'm sure you'll find out why it's interesting and suspicious. There were multiple insurance policies, and we will get into that, but let's hear her tell him all that. Who was, who was your friend? 
When Silbernagel asked if Nikki saw anything out of the ordinary when she went into the house, she of course put on the waterworks. She was just sobbing and sobbing. And it looks so much worse knowing that she can't be this bent out of shape. That's got to be guilt-induced crying, and she can turn it right off so quickly. We're going to play it. I'm sorry, let me clarify. Yeah. Before the sergeant reveals that Chad had actually been killed, he says that she knows him best. So what does she think happened to him? Again, it's the sob story about Chad and how she's begged him to go to counseling and how he's so different when he drinks. Still, she doesn't know what happened and she wants to know what happened. That's when he drops the bombshell. He says, I don't know why, but I know how. He's like, I don't know if you watch TV, but we do a lot with digital. We can pull all kinds of information. Let's listen to him tell her this. Well, Nick, you asked me why. Um, I just wanted to know what right. happened. Right. Well, I, I don't know why yet, but I do know how. Oh. Obviously, when we go through something like this, you know, I mean, I don't know if you watch TV much or anything, but... I don't watch TV. Um, we're able to do a lot with digital information. Mm-hmm. You know, we're able to... Um, get information off of cell phones. Mm-hmm. We're able to, to track the location of those cell phones. Mm-hmm. We're able to go back and, and pull surveillance video. Um, even sometimes if someone has turned it off or if it doesn't work, we can still recover that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're able to basically go through that scene and, and find tiny little things mm-hmm. that the naked eye don't, doesn't see. Right. Um, you know, we have a lot of new technology that we can do a lot of stuff with, and, and I, I pulled no stops on this one, right. as you asked me why, right. and I wanted to find out for you. Then he basically confronts her with the fact that Chad's death was not an accident, that they have been able to confirm that, and he thinks that she knows how it happened too. I'm going to say that Chad's death was not an accident. What? Based off of all of the information that I've gathered, Chad's death was not an accident. Mm-hmm. We know how this happened. And Nikki, I think you know how too. Then he says that Chad did not die in a fire. Chad was killed by a gunshot. And she, of course, acts like she's so confused. She kept saying, what? What? And the sergeant goes on to say that there was an autopsy. There was no soot in his throat or his lungs. He died before the fire was set. And there were gunshot wounds that happened before the fire. Then he asked Nikki if there's anyone she can think of who would be involved in this. And she said, no, she doesn't. He gives her some time to come clean before he goes even harder on her. And he asked her, did you see anyone else in the house when you and Earl went in? And she said, no, they were in and out really quickly. Then Silbernagel asked who Earl was to her and asked if they were romantically involved. And she still says no. But now he knows that she's lying. They have seen them kiss on camera. So he tries to get her to just admit that they were involved. But she's like, I'm married. He's married. But he just wanted the best for me and Chad, even though he's seen bruises all over her, and he knows what Nikki has been going through. But then Silver Nagel is like, Chad was killed. Chad was murdered. It's not self-inflicted. There are multiple gunshots. He's trying to like get through to her because she still seems to think that he was depressed and shot himself. And again, with the waterworks, she's just like, why? 
Why would anyone do this? We're gonna play that clip. Nikki, Chad was killed. Chad was murdered. It's not a suicide. There were multiple gunshots. Yes. Is there? Why would anybody? Why would anybody? I don't know, Nikki, but that's what I want to find out. So why? Why was? Why would that happen to Chad? That's when Silbernagel confronted Nikki with the conflicting evidence they had found and asked her to stop lying and come clean with what really happened to her husband. He lays it all out in front of her. She's sobbing, saying she just wants him back. Yeah, she wants him back because she's just been caught. Now she wishes she wouldn't have done this. Then an agent from the Bureau of Criminal Investigations comes in the room and Nikki's like, oh, I gotta go. Like She's trying to get out of there. She even tries to stand up. Nikki, this is uh, this is Joy. Hi. Um, he's with uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigations. Hello. Hello. And uh, I have to go soon. Mm -hmm. But not so fast, because now he's playing bad cop, and they've now this is a strategy, but they've cornered her. Like the bad cop is sitting here, and the good cop is kind of going against the wall because he wants to get all oh, the rapport, poor Nikki, and the bad cop. He is not playing any games. He begins telling her that he personally processed the crime scene. And bottom line, she's lying. He goes hard right away asking about Earl, and she lies again, saying that he's just there on business. And that's what he's in town doing, that he was nice enough to help her when she needed it. But he's putting the heat on, asking about the fact that Nikki was staying with Earl at the hotel. But she's trying to convince him, no, 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 he was already staying there. And then he kind of just let me have the couch because, you know, the furnace. But this agent, I like him. He was like, so how did Chad feel about you staying with another man? And I'm telling you right now, her demeanor and everything she's saying in this interview, it starts to make no sense. She's so tripped up. And finally she says, well, Chad didn't think anything of it. And the agent's like, Really? Because I'm a married man and I would take issue with that. He's like, what would you do if Chad was staying with Earl's wife in a hotel room and you were home alone? And again, she makes excuses that they're all friends. But the agent is like, hmm, we found some stuff on your phone that says you're more than friends. And okay, at this point, they have selfies of her and Earl together, not to mention videos of Walmart the hotel, all of that. And she goes crazy. She had like diarrhea of the mouth. It was the, we're going to play a tiny clip of it. She's so flustered. She just keeps saying, you know, after everything she's saying, she can't get out a sentence. It's more than just a friendship. I mean, there's definitely a romantic relationship there, right? Okay. So if I told you that we had some, some information from some of the apps on your phone that says differently, what would you say to that? I think we can say anything. Huh? You know, we can talk back and forth. I mean, we yeah, have to talk back and forth and say, you know, yeah, I think he's, you know, super nice person. He thinks uh -huh. that, you know, I'm super beautiful. And, you know, it's, I do, I, you know, I like hanging out with him. I, you know, I miss him when he's not around. And I don't have a whole lot of friends to hang out with. I don't, you know, I don't go out. I don't, you know, I don't hang out. Um, I'm not big into the drinking scene. I'm not big into... All that, you know, so when we get together, we, you know, we hang out, we, you know, sit and talk, you know, we do this. And that. They found a picture of Earl and there's text on the screen and it says, I want you in my bed between my legs. I'm pretty sure she wrote that to him, right? I, want I can't you tell. In my bed. I can't tell either, but a guy doesn't usually, I don't know. Well, I don't know. You tell us. And she's still saying that they're just friends. And they went through her search history. This woman had Googled funeral homes before she even knew or should have known that Chad was dead. At 10.45 a.m. on January 2nd, before she called 911, she is Googling funeral homes. Oh my gosh. And then they find an email that she sent to Earl with listings of homes to look at. And the subject line is homes to consider. And this was on January 4th after they killed Chad. So they're just trying to get a confession. I mean, the evidence is there. So the agent's like, listen, this crime and what happened to Chad was either done by a monster 
Or maybe someone had a reason. Again, giving Nikki a way out. The agent asks what she and Earl were doing at her house at one o'clock in the morning. She makes the excuse that she just needs her meds, but they found the bag of medication and guess what? The bag wasn't even opened. So she didn't desperately need her meds and they confronted her about that. Nikki knows she's got to try to get herself out of trouble. So she offered a different version of events. She told investigators that she and Earl went to the house to celebrate New Year's and Chad and Earl talked and drank like old friends do, just having a good time together. Yeah, right. But then Nikki began arguing with Chad about the furnace and decided to leave. So she left to the garage and waited for Earl to take her back to the hotel. Earl put his boots on and came out to the car and they both left the house together around 2 a.m. The following day, she asked Earl to return to the house to get her medication, which she accidentally left behind. When she arrived, Chad was sleeping. When asked why she put cameras on privacy mode during the visit, she stated that other people had access to her system. So she wasn't the only one who tried to turn the cameras on privacy mode. Then she said it must have been because she had her hand on the phone and accidentally pressed the button. Her explanation was that she did it to update the geofence so it wouldn't beep when she arrived and exited the property because she didn't want to wake Chad up. It's just dizzying to listen to all of her versions of these stories, but in this new version, she and Earl returned to the house at 6.32 a.m. because, like he said, she needed her medication. But she claims she just snuck in and left a few minutes later at 6.38 a.m. When confronted by the time log and the inconsistencies, she says now, oh, I don't really remember what time I entered or left or how long we stayed. And maybe... She, she actually gives this as an excuse. Maybe it was Earl, you know, the super close family friend. He might have gone back into the house while Nikki was sleeping. And then she remembered, wait a minute. He did go back and he saw Chad's truck and was still there. So he never went inside. But the surveillance camera on the door contradicted this story. When confronted with the repeated inconsistencies at this point, she then said she told Chad she was leaving him and he actually threatened to kill her. She claimed that he had done this in the past and he'd forced her to have sex with him and beaten her up. But that night, there was no physical violence or confrontation because Earl was there to protect her. And she gives one of the craziest versions of the story. And I mean, I have to give her some credit because her imagination is wild, but she claimed there was another person in the house. Wow. She said a man came up from the basement out of nowhere while she and Earl were there. And this unknown man that she had never seen before called Chad Hun. Like, hey, Hun, he's calling from the basement. She's implying that Chad and this other man were in some type of romantic relationship. How far-fetched is she willing to go with this story? Now he's the one cheating and it's with a man? She even tried to describe this person. She had the sergeant and the agent stand up and she was trying to remember how tall the guy was. And this went on for hours. She even drew her own composite sketch. And I'm not trying to make light of this. This drawing. But I laughed when I saw this. And I have to laugh because it is so absurd. I'm not making light of the fact that a man was murdered, but it is truly laughable that this woman thinks she can get away with this. Find this man. <laughs> This is your man. She went on to say that the unknown man and Chad started to argue over this large gambling debt that they had. And that's when she went into the car and she doesn't know what happened after that. She said Earl was inside though. And Earl and Chad also got into an argument. She said she waited in the car for about 15 minutes. And then when Earl came out, he told her that Chad was no longer alive. What? I mean, these stories are just back and forth. And this was six hours of this. Can you imagine what these investigators had to go through? And they have to listen. Right. And this new version, Chad was in a rage over Earl helping Nikki to leave him. There was a struggle over the gun and Chad was shot. Then Earl went back inside and confirmed that Chad was dead and started a fire to cover it up. Now Nikki never mentioned the third man. Yeah, now the third man's out of the equation and now it goes, no, it was actually Earl and Chad. They were fighting. She said she knew Chad was dead and she decided to call him and sick to work to buy some time. Instead of calling the authorities. 
She started to panic. When his coworkers began calling her, she told them she was too busy to check on him. Nikki's phone logs showed that she received nine calls from Chad's coworkers between 8.59 a.m. and 9.14 a.m. on January 2nd, 2020. Nikki let the calls go to voicemail and called Earl instead. Then she received four more calls from Chad's coworkers and again called Earl. That's when investigators believed that she and Earl returned to the house and started the fires again to hide evidence, knowing that the fire must have gone out because there was no news of a fire yet. The co-workers went out there and didn't see anything. We know the fires burned themselves out due to the lack of oxygen. Plus, they knew that she was the one that created all the system changes with her login credentials with her username, Nikki Ansel. On Chad's phone, he had login credentials too under the username Chad Ansel, but none of the logins were created by Chad. Nikki had maintained that she didn't know what happened to Chad, that she wasn't inside the house. And surprisingly, after her interview, Nikki was allowed to leave. And apparently, after thinking about things, she wanted to offer yet... Another version of events, and I know as the audience, you're probably getting very annoyed with all this, and trust me, we are very annoyed as well. But let's keep going so you know everything. Just a few days later, on January 9th, Nikki again went to speak with investigators at the sheriff's office. During this new interview, Nikki told investigators that she and Earl did go out to the house together on Monday, December 30th, 2019, around 8.30 p.m. They arrived in Earl's white truck to retrieve some of Nikki's personal property because she was planning to move to Texas. She said they returned early in the morning of December 31st, 2020, around 1 a.m. and Chad was sleeping. In this new version of events, there was no celebrating New Year's with Chad. No drinking, no fighting, or a third man. Right. And before they left, Earl told Nikki to go see if Chad was still sleeping. Then Earl went back and took a gun he found downstairs into Chad's bedroom and shot Chad. According to Nikki, Earl never told her that he was planning to kill Chad, and she only learned of his death after the fact. She told investigators that she saw Earl with a tall black and wood gun. She said she heard two gunshots fired within five to ten minutes of one another. She told investigators it was Earl who staged the bedroom to make it look like Chad had taken his own life. Earl emptied the alcohol bottles, then placed them on the bed to make it look like Chad had been drinking. She said that after Earl had killed Chad, she came to the bedroom and saw that Chad was dead. And there was a lot of blood on the floor and the walls. So she helped to clean up some of the blood before Earl decided to make it look like the space heater had malfunctioned and started a fire. Well, doesn't that sound like a great story? But after receiving the evidence, investigators determined that on December 30th, 2019, Earl had purchased a torch tote or a torch kit from a store called Praxair, using a debit card from a joint checking account that he shared with Nikki Ensel. He has a shared bank account. He's married with a wife and a child in Canada, and he has a joint checking account with a woman that he's planning to move to Texas with. And she's also married to someone else? No wonder people have trust issues. The firefighters discovered that the torch kit in the garage hadn't been used yet. It appeared they were going to use it to set the house on fire since the four previous fires they tried to set in the bedroom and the basement hadn't worked. The torch kit had been assembled, but it was in new condition and hadn't been used. The oxygen and gas tanks were full when the torch kit was purchased. When investigators took them back to Praxair for examination, they found that the tanks were completely empty. So what this meant is that it appeared that they left the valves open on purpose, hoping that their sorry excuse of a fire would travel to that portion of the house and boom, it would explode. So evil. And not just evil, but pretty dumb. And this isn't just my opinion. The investigators actually called them bumbling idiots. Those were their words. And these people were not criminal masterminds. They weren't subtle either. They had sent emails back and forth regarding purchasing the torch kit. And this was further proving that arson was always part of their cover-up plan. Investigators thought they planned to use the torch to get the house to explode, but it didn't work either. There was a tremendous amount of evidence that this murder was pre-planned. Remember we mentioned insurance? Well, Nikki purchased renter's insurance on December 26th, and it went into effect on December 27th. This was three days before Chad was murdered. 
Once Nikki got the email proof that the insurance was in full effect, guess who she forwarded that email to? Who? Good old Earl. The premium for the policy had been paid with the same joint banking account held by Nikki and Earl. She only purchased the insurance in her name, leaving Chad off the policy. On the day Chad's body was found, Nikki told Officer Walker that she was leaving Chad and moving her children to Texas. So it doesn't make sense why she would purchase $31,000 worth of renter's insurance for a home that she was sharing with Chad, unless she knew that it was going to burn down. And there was a call they pulled up when she was speaking to this insurance company, and she was going over all the jewelry that she purchased from a local jewelry store called Riddles, and she needed all these receipts to provide to the insurance company so that if anything happened to this jewelry, she would be set and be reimbursed. In addition to the insurance that Nikki had secured just days before Chad was murdered, Chad also had a life insurance policy, and Nikki was listed as a beneficiary. It appeared that Nikki and Earl had planned to start a new life in Texas, and they would be getting about $600,000 in various insurance policies from Chad's death. They were able to pull up a video from the jewelry store, and it shows that Earl and Nikki go in on January 1st, a day before reporting the fire at Chad's. It's at 2.52 p.m., and they're asking for those appraisal receipts. Wow. Wow. And here are all those receipts for various things like an amethyst pair of earrings, necklaces, even her wedding ring. So that was it. They had enough evidence to arrest Nikki and even got a confession that she knew Chad had been killed. And yet she withheld that information. But she had the audacity to ask if she'd be able to attend Chad's funeral which was the next day, and investigators were like, uh, no, you're going to jail. Well, the last thing she's asked to do is to write out her written statement, and she's pissed that she's getting arrested. So she reaches over and grabs it. She tries to rip it up, but Silbernagel is able to get it out of her hands. They just caught a glimpse of the real Nikki. The very next day, after she's had even more time to think in her jail cell, she calls for detectives to come talk to her. And now it's all Earl. She blames everything on him. It was all his idea, but at this point, they charge both her and Earl with conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit arson, and conspiracy after the fact to tamper with evidence. There's an arrest warrant for Earl. Earl had actually fled back to Canada, but after the news reports that authorities were looking for him, that same day, on January 10th, Earl drove to the border of Canada and the U.S. in Michigan and turned himself in. He's taken into custody in Michigan and given the chance to come clean. But instead, he immediately asked for a lawyer. They end up searching his truck, and inside they found the other spur that matches the one that Nikki had hanging from her rearview mirror. A realty magazine from Bismarck, a package with Nikki's name on it. This all ties him to Bismarck, even though there's more than enough evidence to prove that he had been there. Once he has an attorney, he gives his statement that it all started with cookies. Then Nikki is a baker, and he ordered some cookies, because why not? Those were his words. Then the relationship became romantic, and Nikki told him all about how horrible Chad was, and she eventually convinced Earl to help her escape Chad and move to Texas. And after he was able to get her secured on her own, he said he was going to stop seeing her. His words were that you can sniff out crazy eventually, and she doesn't seem like she's all there all the time. But they still didn't know who shot Chad. Both Nikki and Earl claimed that they were there, but both of them are pointing the finger at one another. Now, Earl did claim that he got into a little confrontation with Chad because he told Chad that Nikki was leaving him. Chad kicked him out of the house because he said he was going to call the police. So he left the house and sat in the car. They're not really buying the story because why would Earl leave Nikki alone with the man that she was claiming was hurting her? Wasn't it the plan for Earl to protect her? But he claims that she came out and they left. And then on the way back to the hotel, she admits that she killed Chad. And Earl looks at her and says that he will deal with it for her, meaning he would cover it up, get rid of the evidence, stage the scene. Remember how Nikki entered the hotel an hour before Earl? It makes me wonder if some of this is actually the truth. If he drops Nikki off, returns, tries to cover their tracks, and then comes back afterward. Either way, they're both in this together. Earl admitted that he did set the fire in Chad's room, but then for some reason, he denies that he set the second one in the basement, even though there was that label from the cigarette carton. 
I don't know why he doesn't just admit to both. Due to COVID, the trial didn't begin until February 2023. Nikki and Earl were supposed to be tried together. However, that didn't happen because Earl decided to take a plea deal, making him eligible for parole after 25 years. Because the evidence didn't prove who actually fired the shots, neither were charged with first-degree murder. Instead, they were both only charged with conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. They also were never able to determine whose um, bloody handprint was on the wall. It was just too degraded. The prosecutor, Julie Ann Lawyer, that's a perfect last name to become an attorney, or maybe she got married and that was her husband's last name. But either way, prosecutor, lawyer, which reminds me of Judge Judge in Brian Koberger's case, she put on a great opening statement to the jury. She explained that Nikki Sue Ensel helped Earl Howard, her secret lover, murder her husband, Chad, and stage it as though Chad had taken his own life by setting the house on fire. She explained at first the scene looked like this could be true, but soon things just didn't add up. She told the jury that the investigators conducted a very thorough investigation and eventually all the evidence told the story and it gave a complete picture of events. She also mentioned Nikki's chatty discussion with the deputy who arrived at the scene. The prosecutor explained that there were records and records of phone calls in this case the day after Chad's body was found where Nikki was already trying to profit off of her husband's death. On January 3rd, Nikki, in a tearful phone call, spoke to a customer service representative at Progressive Insurance, explaining that she had just lost her husband in a tragic house fire. She told the representative that a faulty furnace caused the fire, and she couldn't even bear to return to the home to see if any of her things were salvageable. They gave Nikki an emergency advance of $2,500. When I heard this call... I was disgusted because this insurance agent is being so caring and kind to a killer. It makes me sick. What happened? When did it happen and what happened? I called my husband last night. The house fire. You were at a house fire? My husband. I'm sorry. Our home caught on fire. And my husband was in there. You lost your husband, dear? <laughs> yeah, and the host last night, they found a new fireman did. Wow, dear. Wow. All right, dear. All right, let's recollect ourselves. What was really surprising is the defense attorney decided to not give an opening statement at all. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that. Me Just too. nothing. No explanation, no trying to make Nikki look like less than a monster. And this trial only lasted one week. The prosecution called a number of really valuable witnesses from Chad's friends, family who truly showed what a great man he was, all the crime scene investigators, the detectives, the special agents, the hotel staff, the list goes on and on. The coroner even confirmed that Chad's body did not indicate that he was a severe alcoholic. He wouldn't have been able to be consuming two cases of whiskey a month. If he had been an alcoholic, there would have been physical signs of this and heavy damage to his liver. Chad's sister, Lori, said her brother occasionally drank, but it wasn't to excess. She also described his demeanor when he drank as giggly and sleepy. She also said that Nikki told her that she had blood cancer, and that was what was causing some of the bruising on her body. But Lori never saw any bruises herself. And we know Nikki does not have blood cancer or any other type of cancer. So again, she's just a liar, always playing the victim of some kind. The only person who could corroborate Nikki's allegations of physical harm was her brother, Matthew Hines. He told the jury that he met his sister and Earl at McDonald's a few days before the murder, and that's when Nikki allegedly confessed that Chad had been hitting her. Further proof was brought in when forensic investigators examined the murder weapon. The shotgun could only hold two shells at a time, and Chad was shot twice. But the shotgun had another unspent shell. This meant that after Chad was shot the first time, someone had to reload the gun with at least two more shells. Chad certainly didn't reload the gun and then shoot himself in the back of the head. The second shell casing was never recovered. This meant someone removed it from the scene, hoping to convince investigators that Chad was only shot once. But the fire failed to hide the evidence that Chad had been shot twice. The prosecution also shared that Nikki and Earl came very close to getting away with Chad's murder. When the investigators requested an autopsy, they were turned down because the coroner believed his death was self-inflicted. 
they had to push for the autopsy and show other evidence before the medical examiner agreed to conduct the examination. The prosecution wrapped up their case with the lead detective playing the over six hours of interrogation videos in the three separate interviews with Nikki. Over the week, they called over 45 witnesses who helped weave together the very premeditated case of murder. And after all that, the defense didn't call one witness, not one. No one to defend Nikki. Mr. Glass, how will Ms. Intel proceed? Uh, <clears throat> Your Honor, uh, the defense will not be calling any witnesses. The defense rests. And the prosecution didn't even put Earl on the stand either. And that's because there was this murder charge still being investigated. And if they put him on the stand, he could have plead the fifth anyway. So the prosecution rested. And then they did a masterful job with their closing arguments by weaving the story together with all of the things that we presented to you for a minute by minute breakdown of each event. She was a one woman show and she put on a great case. She told the jury that all three charges were related to conspiracy, conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit arson and conspiracy to tamper with evidence. The defense put on a closing, but it was extremely brief. Defense counsel Thomas Glass stated that the prosecution did a great job depicting what happened to Chad Ensel. It involved call logs and surveillance video of Earl Howard, his truck, and his movements. But there was no Earl Howard at the defense table and no testimony from Earl Howard. He told the jury that there was no way to determine who had shot Chad, and for that reason, they had reasonable doubt and couldn't convict his client because unanswered questions meant reasonable doubt. Well, it didn't take long for the jury to come back with a verdict, and I think you probably know what it was. It only took two hours. It was so quick that Lori and Deborah they went to get a bite to eat, and they weren't even able to get back in time to hear the verdict. They found Nikki guilty of her husband's calculated and cold-blooded murder. Let me play that clip for you. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled action to make the following finding regarding the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel. Conspiracy to commit murder. As to the charge of conspiracy to commit murder, we find the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel, guilty. Conspiracy to commit arson. As to the charge of conspiracy to commit arson, we find the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel, guilty. Conspiracy to tamper with physical evidence. As to the charge of conspiracy to tamper with physical evidence, we find the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel, guilty. At Nikki's sentencing hearing, Chad's mother told the judge that Chad was deeply missed and, quote, it is a wound that will never heal. No mother should ever have to bury their child, end quote. Chad's sister Lori said, quote, you took many things away from me, but most importantly, a piece of my heart is missing. We are not victims, but a community of broken survivors. We will miss Chad forever. And I speak for a lot of people when I say, I hope you rot in eternity, end quote. Nikki's attorney thought the judge should consider that her co-conspirator only got a 50-year sentence with a 25 years suspended. He also allegedly manipulated Nikki into the murder plot, but the judge disagreed. Nikki spoke on her behalf. She told the court that she had learned some very hard life lessons since she was young. She said her life and her boys' lives were good at first, but then one day, her boys started sharing that Chad was hurting them. So now it's their kids being hurt. Right, now it's the boys in this new version of her story. And she said Chad had been hitting the boys and locked them in their rooms all day. Then he told Nikki she needed to move out. She stated, quote, Your Honor, I have been through all kinds of abuse. My boys have. I have lived through this every single day. I was told to take a plea deal, but I didn't want to. I wanted to go to trial to prove my innocence, end quote. She went on to complain that she was already suffering from the loss of not being able to be in contact with her sons and asked the judge to, quote, have some consideration for me, end quote. Well, shouldn't she have had some consideration for Chad? The judge disagreed and told Nikki she had caused significant harm and had shown little to no remorse. Nikki was sentenced to life in prison for conspiracy to commit murder and received two additional 15-year sentences for the two lesser charges. She must serve 85% of her sentence over 36 years and 105 days before she can be considered for parole. Nikki appealed her conviction on the grounds that the jury convicted her of conspiracy to commit murder because her alleged co-conspirator didn't testify against her or offer any evidence of their agreement to commit murder together. Her appeal was denied, and the Supreme Court for North Dakota affirmed her guilty verdict. Good. 
And in the end, Nikki's greed didn't just cost her her freedom. It shattered lives. Her plot to kill her husband robbed his family and friends of a kind and loving man, but it also tore apart her own family. Nikki's actions are a stark reminder that greed can destroy everything we hold near and dear, leaving behind a trail of devastation that no amount of money could ever justify. Chad's death was not just a loss for his loved ones, but it's a tragic example of the destructive power of greed and how it can completely blind people and cause them to become so evil and so callous that they no longer see others as human beings. We know that this has been a very long case, a very convoluted and twisted story, but I think they're important to tell. And it definitely makes me understand why people have trust issues because this is a woman who said she loved this man married this man, was with him for years. It just, it always blows my mind, no matter how many cases we do. I don't understand why people can't just get a divorce. Well, because they don't get a prenuptial agreement and then they're fighting and they know we're getting a prenuptial agreement. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we are. But you know what? That's normal. Nobody should be shameful about making things set so that you don't argue. It's super easy. It's like when you go into it, you agree and you're like, that's how it's going to be. Yeah, cool. Well, we are so appreciative that you are here for another one of our videos. And like always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on what's next. And we will see you in our next video. Bye. Bye.